540H29A. I will restore, saith the Lord. New York, New York, you see. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our kind Heavenly Father, we thank thee for song. How to thrill the hearts to hear those wonderful gospel songs. Only believe, then Jesus came. It inspires us to move on. We are thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of this great army that's marching on to Calvary, crucifying the old man, the flesh, and being raised a new person in his being. And I pray today that you will bless this gathering together here in the arena. May the Holy Spirit have complete charge of every heart in here that could lead us, guide us, speak through us, or speak to us in any way that he desires. We commit ourselves to you, and we pray that you'll use us this afternoon for the glory and the building of the kingdom. Forgive us of our sins and trespass us and deliver us. And to us today the forgiveness of sins, healing of our bodies, salvation of our souls, and at the end of this journey we will bow our head, humbly giving thee thanks and praise for you ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated and the Lord bless each of you. Good evening to you this afternoon of New York and different places we have gathered in this little group. There's perhaps people represented here from many different places, states, and cities. And it is indeed a privilege for me to have you as my audience today. The cream of the crop, I would say, and I don't say that boastfully. I don't say that to make you feel good. I say it because it comes from my heart. I do love Christian people, my brothers and sisters. My ministry is such that I can't meet people the way that I do. I have been called a nationalist, but I'm not. There is no one knows how I love my brothers and sisters, yet I cannot be a servant of mankind and be a servant of God at the same time. I must keep myself away in order to be in prayer, to serve mankind by God, visions and so forth. That's the reason they don't permit interviews and so forth like that, is because their time must be spent in prayer and alone. Then, when I come to the audience at night, before sometimes runs into thousands and thousands of people, and then the Satan is just at every corner, just trying to find one floor, one sleep up, that's all he wants. And then everyone, but not everyone, Christians wouldn't, but then believer would point at that, as long as you live, he'd keep shoving that back. The Sunday afternoon is usually given to me to speak. And as I am, I don't profess to be very much of a speaker because of the lack of eloquence and my speech is very bad and I'm uneducated and i just a Kentucky corn cracker with my words of heat, hate, toast, fetch, curry, you just put up with it. That's uh, someone said long, long ago, said by the Branham, said, we're going to uh, give to you, I was on the West Coast from a great organization, said, we want to give you an honorary degree. Said you've written a couple of books, so we'll give you either LLD or DD. I said, uh, oh my, I don't hardly know what you're talking about, brother. He said, well, don't you think if we give you a doctor's degree? I said, huh, and me saying, here it is, and hint and fetch and carry. I said, people are too intelligent to know that. They know that I'm not, not no doctor of divinity. I said, I'd just rather be an old Sassafras preacher like I am, like this, just where the Lord wants me, stay just this way, and then you know what I am, and I'm not putting on nothing, I'm just myself, and that's the way all of us should be, just ourselves. If you got education enough to be a doctor or something, another like that, I admire you, but to me, I haven't got it. So there's no need of me trying to say this, that or the other, I'm just not. So. If you say you was, people would know better than that. That's a real thing about divine healing. The people know whether you really mean it or not. They can tell it. And I have learned that in my walk of life to know that you cannot get by impersonating something. You've got to be just what you are. Now I have studied that and I, how would you like just before I start my sermon, I haven't got my watch today, so I left it. If I would just give you a little insight of something that's a real secret just to me and about healing powers and so forth like that. 
how many full gospel people is here let's see your hand full gospel people way up with your hand would you like to know also secret and if you would raise your hand again just a minute all right hey it is friend the secret of the whole thing is divine love that's the secret of every bit of us is love if you you can't make yourself love you've got to have love love is something that it will work on animal life it will work on human life it works before god i believe paul said in first corinthians 13 they speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not love or charity he profit me nothing though i have all the knowledge to understand all the mysteries of god and have not love though he could do it it profits me nothing and though i have faith to move the mountains i have not love it profits me nothing where there's tongues or seas where there's prophecies it will vanish and where there's these things would all pass away but when love had come it in earth forever lord i have seen it in its power you're reading this little book i suppose that we got here the brother and sister are selling them not today because we respect sunday as a resurrection and i've never sold on sunday i don't believe in it cause it's all right if you do many of the brethren saw their books right on on sunday so it's part of the gospel that's okay i have nothing against it but if i just can't do it myself i just when i used to be a trapper i would go on a saturday night after midnight many times and throw traps along with that i took up fishing lines and on trot lines on the river and take the bait off of them keep from fishing on sunday and thing when i was a sinner and after i became a christian i'm sure i'll want to stick with it now but love you've noticed in this book how many has read the book let's see your hand did you notice when that maniac or i believe it um, is that book you have brother wood it is yeah the one that where the maniac up at oregon ran out on the platform to kill me that time you remember that of reading it in the book you know what conquered that fellow the love of god i didn't despise that man there was something happened to me there that i loved him i thought poor fellow bound down with his evil spirit that's what makes him feel like he wants to kill me the man wouldn't want to read himself he's a human that's what it was what would you think if i told you of a fellow i knew that he used to be a game warden down in indiana and one day he was going to make a call at a place and usually crossing through the field he um they usually had carried a gun because he'd had two there's just like the police on the force or something it's a law a rule and this man while crossing the field there's a great big bull over there in that field and he didn't know was in the field he knew this fellow had bought it and uh, but he forgot it and he's going through the field this big fellow raised up and he had just killed a colored man about six months old before that down at Bucks farm and he was up here on this other farm and he had long horns they had ends of then cut off but he was an awful he was a fine species of an animal but he has he was a very bad killer he had killed this card man got him to death and they had sold him and while crossing the field out 200 yards from the fence or tree or anything else in a little bunch of cluster bushes this big fellow raised up and snorted and took after this minister who claimed to have the baptism of the holy spirit and instead of being started to run or scream he loved the animal he felt sorry because he disturbed that animal and that fellow come right just as hard as he could come and his head down snorting throwed his horns into the ground many of you knows that's fooled around cattle and here he come well he got oh perhaps within 20 yards no need of trying to run you couldn't run anyhow no bush no tree to get into you just have to stand and face it that's all he could not run you and you had two or three hundred yes to offense no trees at all so here he comes and something just happened and instead of hitting the bull or wanting to kill it a perfect piece settled down i thought i disturbed the poor fellow and when he got real to me real close i said now i'm sorry i disturbed you i am the servant of the lord and i charge thee in the name of our lord jesus christ our creator that you go over there and lay down and here come the bull coming right on but somehow 
I wasn't a bit more afraid than I am right here. Before lovely Christians, he got within about 10 feet of where I was standing, and I just stood there looking at him, not a more afraid than I am of this meek-looking little lady sitting here looking at me. And he ran right to me, and when he got right up close to me, he just threw his feet out and stopped. And he looked this way and looked around, so depleted, turned around, walked over, and go lay down under the bush. What did it see? The trouble of it is, people ask here today. I remember here not long ago, mowing my yard out front, I was mowing a little mower, and any of you that's been down at my place, I got quite a front yard, and I had to put on my old, we call them overalls, I think you all, up here in the north, call them junkeries or something. I'd get out there and mow the yard, and I'd have to put this on, a car load of people drive out to be prayed for, and I'd sleep around the back, I'd go in, put on my clothes, other clothes, and go in and pray for the sick, come back after they'd leave and put on maybe, make about two rounds, and here come another load, and I'd run again on the front yard, I was grown up before I could get in the backyard. It was growing up ahead of me. So one day is in the backyard I was mowing. They had a little fence runs down and I put the children up a little matting box there and a big bunch of hornets had inhabited that box. So I had forgot about it and I took off being in the backyard where no one could see me just strip down to my waistline here with just my overall and my oh it's awfully hot and I was just shoving the lawnmower you know a little old pat 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 and I was hitting and I hit the fence and before I knew it I was covered over with hornets you know what hornets are those big fellows and they just swarmed all over me and something happened I thought that's strange I am um, now this sounds kind of a kiddie story but it isn't told for that and almighty God who will judge us at the judgment knows it I said, little fellows, I'm sorry I disturbed you. I said, I haven't got time to play with you this afternoon. So you hurry back in the name of our Peter, the Lord Jesus Christ, and run back in your box. I won't hit it no more. I'll get away from there. Just kept on moving. And the Lord of God of heaven, who knows this to be the truth, them fellows circled around me and took a beeline and went right straight back in that box and settled down. That's exactly right. Now, that same thing, brother, you can't fool the animal. You know what I love? I had time this afternoon. I'd like to preach on nature because that was my first Bible. How that I love nature because God is in nature. God is in his flower. God is in his universe. God is everywhere. And just as sure as you can't fool the animal, he knows whether you're afraid of him or not. I'm sure maybe you don't get that. Look at St. Paul. When God told him he was going down to Rome and when he was shipwrecked out there, he picked up some sticks to throw them in a fire and a great viper beat him through the hand, which would absolutely cause his death within a couple of minutes. And Paul looked at it, not a bit more scared than anything, walked over and shook it over the fire, just up acted as if no harm would ever come, went right ahead. They thought first that he was going to drop down dead, but they changed their mind then and called him a god. See, he wasn't scared. The reason it hurts you is because you will get scared. Don't be scared. If you can get a perfect love of God in your heart that knows that this is the truth and God is your father and he's taking care of you, there's nothing can harm you. I'll give them power. They'll tread on serpents and so forth and nothing in all ways shall harm them. So if you want to get close to God, just get close to love. Just love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, with all your strength. Just wrap yourself in a bundle of love. Watch that man that you didn't like, like you. Did you ever get around anybody? You have seen nice people that you couldn't hardly stand to be around them. Now you know that's right, isn't it? And I've seen people that maybe that you just love to be in their presence. Haven't you seen people like that? Do you realize that your sons of God, the atmosphere in the air that you live in, you create a situation around you that either draws or pushes away? I better leave that subject alone. And read what I was going to because I'm afraid. You're not getting that, you see? That's deeper things that the church has yet got to learn.
that's right, deeper things. We're taught in this ritualistic and so forth, and it's set down and cut and write for us. But when you come into the real, and it's not something way off, you can't understand, it's just as close as your hand is to you, you just look over the top of it, it's so simple, till you overlook it, see? That's what it does it. Now, in the event of this afternoon, and someone will watch, if you will, some of them, and let me know when I've been in here about three quarters of an hour or something like that, because we have another service tonight, and we, this afternoon, is always give to me, so I can just relax, I can talk, and uh, you're not... A healing service is just a service where you can just talk to the people and it makes you feel relaxed. And I'm so thankful to have this opportunity. Now you, in your Bibles, the good Lord, blessed word of the Lord, let's turn to Joel for subject, Joel the first chapter, and begin reading the, with the first of us and read a little bit of the word. And then we're going to also take a text out of the second chapter of Joel. How many loves the word of the Lord? Say amen. Conscience says amen. That's good. I'm glad you are a lover of the word of the Lord and the word because I believe the word. And now we read this from the first verse of Joel 1. This, the word of the Lord that came unto Joel, thus uh, hear this, ye old men, and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and let their children another generation. That which the palmer worm has left has a locust eaten. That which the locust has left has a canker worm eaten. That which the canker worm has left has a caterpillar eaten. Now, over in the second chapter of Joel, in the 25th verse, we read this. And I will restore unto you the ears that the locust hath eaten, and the palmer worm and the caterpillar, my great army, which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wonderfully with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Now, there's no man in the world that can open this word. We might turn the pages back, but there's only one that can open it. That's the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Jesus Christ. John, when he was in the Isle of Patmos, he saw the book in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, and he wept because there was no man in heaven worthy, no man in the earth or beneath the earth was worthy to take the book or to loose, to open the book or to loose the seals. And a lamb that had been slain from the foundation of the world came and took it out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne and opened it and loosed the seals because he was worthy. And that's the lamb that can open it to us this afternoon. Is that right? If you will, with me, bow your heads and let us speak to him just a moment and ask him to open this word. Can Heavenly Father, we approach thee in all the sufficient name of the Son, the Lord Jesus, the worthy one, and we pray today that the mercies may rest upon us all. And may that now he who could open the book and was worthy to take it, may he come and open the word to us that our understanding might be open and enlightened for the glory of his kingdom, that we might be encouraged to live better Christian lives and to have a good courage. Comfort us this afternoon, our Holy Father, out of thy word, through the preaching. Now circumcise the lips that speak and the ears that hear, and may every heart receive, and may the Holy Spirit take the word of God now and deliver it to every heart as we have need. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now I want to start. If you bear with me, my boy come and lead his watch down here so i will be sure to understand and i'll listen closely and try to overlook my grammar and maybe the holy spirit take it and place it in your heart now this afternoon and the subject if i would call it a text would be i will restore to you saith the lord now to he's speaking here of a tree and god always likens his people to a tree as the tree as the life of a tree, so will my people be. And the Jews was considered the tame olive tree, the, and the Gentiles the wild olive tree. And in, I believe, in Zechariah, where they were, they, the wild olive tree, was grafted into the tame olive tree. And Paul spoke in Romans and so forth about this same thing, of the different olive trees and their work. Then he speaks here of an army called caterpillars and cankerworms and palmer worms and locusts coming 
upon the earth and eating this tree down. Now, in basing this, all things that we have on earth today come from Genesis. Genesis is the beginning. The very word Genesis means the beginning, the start. And then in the book of Genesis, every cult that we have today in the world, every spirit that we have today, originated in Genesis in the beginning. Can you hear me way back there? The uh, my wife tells me it just seems like it rumbles on this. Can you hear all right way back in the back? If you can lift your hands up in the back on this, can you hear all right? Thank you. Maybe if I stand back a little bit, I'll be better. Now, God started all things in Genesis. His every cult that we have today, every religion we have today began in Genesis. Every plant life, tree, everything that we have began in Genesis. Human life began, animal life began, everything began in Genesis in the beginning. We have to take notice of these things. For instance, like Babylon. We find out that Babylon appears in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, Babylon was founded by Nimrod, a son of Ham. And at first, it was called the Gates of Paradise. After, it was called Confusion. Babylon appears in Genesis. Babylon appears in the middle of the Bible, and Babylon appears of a revelation. It was the origin and the beginning of idol worship. And it began back there. It lasted and ends up in Revelation, Babylon, all these things due consideration of what they mean. Now, Jesus said that a sower went forth and sowed the seeds, and how they began and sprung up, and through every age, someone asked me the other day, he said, Brother Branham, do you believe that the old-fashioned Methodist and Baptist from the days gone by, before this great light came onto the earth of the restoration of the gifts, and so forth, do you think they'll go in the resurrection? I said, Amen, sure, they will. When the farmer planted his corn, the first two little leaves that sprang up on the corn, that farmer was just as happy with that corn as he could be. As the corn matured, other leaves sprang. They become old and withered away. But in the resurrection, when the grain is taken from the corn, them leaves are reproduced. The Lutheran church was the light of the world at the time. Then come the Wesley age, then the Pentecostal age, and if Jesus studies, it will go on and on in the other ages. But it's all made from the same life, the same Holy Spirit that was in the grain of corn that went into the ground is the same Holy Spirit today. It goes into the tassel, it goes into corn. Tassel is about the Pentecostal age. Pollen began to send out. Now the fruit age is coming in, amen. That's where. When we organize our churches, I have nothing against organization, but to organize religion, the first organized religion there ever was, was the Catholic Church. Never was organized till that time. And then the Protestant Church organized themselves a group, and just each group ought, but out of all of those organizations, God takes a pure in heart. Amen? Now, amen means so be it. Someone said with Abraham, when you were preaching, I believe at Denver, said, how could you make out what you were saying? Everybody hollering, Amen. I said, if there wasn't, I'd be kind of quiet. Amen means so be it. That's there. When someone says, oh, Amen, it doesn't excite me. It encourages me to know that someone is believing what being said. Now, as we notice in the beginning of Genesis, I want to bring a picture to you, if God willing to, and will help us, after the first sin had been committed from Adam and Eve, we realized that the world was perfect. And then Satan got into the serpent, not a reptile, a beast, and deceived Mother Eve. Then sent in sin, and out of Genesis began to spread forth. Let's take at least two spirits out of Genesis and run the church down and find it out where we are living today. The reason I've chosen this little thought this afternoon when God dealt with me yesterday about it, knowing us to speak was because of the prestige of the full gospel churches and how easy. Jesus said himself that in the last days, the two spirits would be so close together, it would deceive the very elect if possible. But by the fruit, you shall know them. Now after Adam and Eve, they brought forth their first son, which was Cain of the devil. The second son was Abel. You said, Brother Branham, do you mean to say Cain? Was of the devil? Sure, he was, son of the devil. Notice, see, Eve, well, Eve said, I have got a son from the Lord. That's true, certainly. God is only creator, but through the spirit that he let come upon you, you couldn't attach that evil thing of Cain upon God. 
Where did he get that nature? He had to be jealous from Satan, his father. Where did he get the spirit of murder? The first murderer. You couldn't see that come out of God. It had to come from the devil. He was of the devil and Abel was of God out of Adam. Notice when both boys, after coming out of the Garden of Eden, they realized that they were mortals and they must die because God had already pronounced death on all mortals. They must die. Oh, I hope you see this picture. And if God willing, I want to make an illustration here this afternoon. Don't know whether I can do it with that or not. I'm going to call this Cain and this Abel so that the children will understand. Cain and Abel both were human beings and had spirits. Now, when both boys realized that they were getting older and they were mortal and they had to die, seeing their mother and father withering away, Cain tilled the soil. Abel was a sheep herder. Then the boy Cain, with his spirit, and Abel with his spirit, those two spirits has come from Genesis and in existence today. The same two spirits living right here in New York. Today, it will prove it by God's word. That's right. They come up out of. And you can take any of these cults now when I return back from overseas with God's help and can come here with some teaching times and so forth. I can prove by God's word that every cult that you can name, I can show it in Genesis, that's right, where it started from. There's nothing new. It's all been all the time. It's just been under different names in disguisement, like today. Uh, epileptic, they call it an epileptic. Jesus called it a devil. It's the same spirit. The boy fell in the water and frogged at the mouth and so forth because Jesus said it was a devil. A cancer in them days was called a devil. The word devil means a tormentor. And that's what it is, a devil, today. The word cancer comes from the Greek word or the Latin word, rather, which means like a crab, legs, that spread forth. That's a medical name, but God calls it a devil. Yet, and it's still, a man in my name, they shall cast out devils. Now, with Cain and Abel, these two that we can could stay on it a week. But just for the high points, notice this man here, Cain. Now, who is this man, Cain? All of you say together, Cain, and this is Abel. Now, let's watch those spirits. Now, both of those boys, strangely thinking, they were both religious. Both of them were religious. Cain was a long ways from being a communist or an infidel. He was a believer. This may shock you. So get your vest ready, all right? He was a believer, not a false believer, a true believer in Jehovah God. So if God only requires a man who will make a confession and a believer, God will be unjust to see this boy and condemn that boy. Is that true? If faith in God is all that a man requires, that God requires, and if this boy had faith in him and this had faith in him, God would be unjust to condemn one except the other. Certainly they would. So you see, I belong to church, Brother Branham. I believe in God. That don't have one thing to do with whether you are going to home to glory or not. You see, Brother Branham, if I openly confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, am I saved? No, sir. If you listen close and don't get up and walk out now, just wait till the end of it. You'll find out why that our dear Brother Billy Graham and them are not getting the job done right is because they're not taking people far enough. They're just getting them to stand up and to say, accept Jesus as my savior. That settles it. And a great revival here not long ago, up here at one of the eastern states, that they claimed to have 30,000 converts, and six weeks later, they couldn't find 30 people holding out. Why? It was just a cold, dry art confession. God requires death and regeneration. That's what's the matter. This man see a believer. The devil walked right out and openly confessed Jesus Christ and said, We know who you are, the Son of God. They wasn't saved. They were devils. Oh, how theology has crumpled up the plan of God. It's a disgrace. We are living in the days of evil. And evil comes usually comes from the pulpit. If the pulpit would have stayed clean and straight, we wouldn't have had all this stuff spread over the world today. And people acting and living the way they are doing in unbelief. 
some great teacher on the west coast met me the other day and he was going on a certain man over there that's got a big church he said the reverend branham do you think that man is a christian i said i have no other reason than to believe he's a christian he said all the divine healing and stuff you all are talking about said you know a long time ago he said we great fine church i won't call its name because i don't believe in talking about anybody but he said we had the greatest churches on the west coast and said along come that cult of christian science and you know what they stripped our churches i said if you a great church would have stayed with the principle of jesus christ and taught divine healing the bible did they would have had to have no card to come on the coast and these people is hollering about tearing up churches and things like that brother hungry children will eat out of a garbage can feed them the word of god and they'll stay where they ought to be that's the truth certainly hungry people every man is trying to look behind the curtain to see where he come from and where he's going if you won't teach it in your church and give him the salvation that he needs for, to his soul he's a son of god in his foreign state yet he's a son of god and he wants to see out yonder he longs to see it god help we ministers to get to the place where we can introduce to them the true and living god and the thing that their soul hungers for after they have confessed and become christians now this man cain was a believer he believed in god he honored god he came to worship and he built an altar built an altar perhaps east of the garden because there's where the cherubim was put with a flaming sword to guard the tree of life and perhaps they went up on the east side of the garden from which the lord will come the savior the tree of life that was in eden and then when they went up to this side of the tree to guard another king built an altar just the same as Abel built an altar in other words Cain built a church and Abel built a church and if belonging to a church and kneeling at your altar is all God requires God would be unjust to condemn this man and receive this man. Both of them was worshippers. Cain knelt down and worshipped God, just the same as Abel did. And not only that, but they were both sacrificers. Cain made a sacrifice. Just the same as Abel made a sacrifice. So, if being a believer of God, belonging to a church, praying at an altar, making a sacrifice, becoming religious, if that's all God requires, God will be unjust to condemn that man. So, you see today how theology has twisted it around. They say as long as you go to church, belong to some faith, be a member of a church, you're all right. That's wrong, except a man be born again of the Spirit of God. He'll in no way end time to the kingdom. He's eternally lost. You... Could hold up your hands and everything a man come to me here on the west coast a few weeks ago he said brother branham i went i've been trying to seek the lord for at least five years he said i went to mr graham's meeting he told me to hold up my hand except jesus I said i did i went with the same thing i went to the free methodist church they told me how to get happy enough to shout and i did and said i went away unsatisfied he said i went to another man's meeting now you all know him brother roberts exactly my buddy my friend he said brother roberts said stay here in there until you speak the tongues then you got it so he said i went in there and i prayed till i did speak the tongues and still I haven't got it i said my brother what billy graham told you is the truth and what the free methodist told you is the truth and what or Robert's told you the truth, but receiving Christ is not whether you shout, whether you hold up your hand, it's receiving the person Christ, Jesus in your heart, and these things are attributes that follow it. That's right. You've got to first get the tree. I can take the apple tree, apple, and I haven't got the tree. Christ, the new birth, then, 
these attributes follow the tree. The tree produces that. See what I mean? Receiving Christ is receiving the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in the human heart. Amen. Notice, O oh, Methodists thought they had it when they shouted. They found out they was wrong. The Pentecostal thought as long as they spoke with tongues, they had it. They found out they were wrong. They spoke with tongues and lived any kind of a life. But when you receive the person, Lord Jesus, in your heart, it makes you a new creature out of you, a new being. Then you can shout and speak with tongues as you have received him, the person of the Lord Jesus. Cain was a worshiper. He paid his vows. He worshipped God, come up and laid his sacrifice down, knelt down on his knees, raised up his hands and said, Jehovah, and worshipped God truly in a form of a worship, just as religious and just as sincere, perhaps, as what this man was. But the only made difference made, this man had a special revelation of God's requirement. Hallelujah. You're going to call me Holy Roller after today anyhow. So you might as well get started. Look, sure, I guess I am. I'm a Baptist. That's right. I'm a Nazarene. That's true. And I'm a Holy Holiness. And I'm a Presbyterian. And I'm a Holy Roller. Brother, brother, I believe that every man that's born of the Spirit of God is a child of God. That's right. Here he is. He had a spiritual revelation that it wasn't by works. It was by grace that we were saved. And that's the only way that you'll ever know the difference. You may... Presbyterian, Lutheran, Baptist people today, the only way you'll never know is God has got to personally reveal himself to you in the power of the Holy Ghost before you'll ever know it. Jesus said himself, the scripture teaches, no man can say Jesus is the Christ only by the Holy Ghost. And without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we are only guessing at it. We are saying, what the word said, you are saying what the pastor says, you are saying what mother said, but when the Holy Spirit comes in and baptizes you into the person of the Christ Jesus, then you know by any personal experience that Jesus Christ is a son of God, raised from the dead, living in you, the hope of glory, amen. Notice Cain had a spiritual revelation, and that's what made the difference between them churches today. The same thing, Jesus, when he came down off the mount, Matthew 16, I believe it is, he says, Who does man say I am? Some say thou art Elias, some say you're Moses. He said, But who do you say? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bajona, for no seminary has taught you this to you. You haven't learned this from some man's theology. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven, has revealed this to you, and upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The whole church of the living God is based upon the spiritual revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. Oh my, I feel like shouting, like a shouting Baptist now. I feel kind of religious, along about some this time of day. Notice, it's enough to make it. It'll make you feel different. This cleans you inside and outside. It makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus, as in Greek puts a new creation. Now Cain thought he was right. He thought because he had done all of his religion, he went up. To his church and he said his prayers and paid in his tithes and a few extra dollars extra he belonged to the one her fine church all beautiful with flowers and everything that's the way the devil has got the church today and i tell you brother i'm not saying this because behind this pulpit god is going to make me answer for every word i say for i have before me the purchase of his blood and i've got to not know any church, any creed. I've got to preach what the Holy Spirit tells me because it's not by notes. I've never had one in, in my life. I just have to. It's wherever I see it, I reach and get it and hand it out. Me come rough, but believe it. It'll make you fat, spiritual speaking. Notice Christ, the hope of glory. Now, when this man came come up and worship the Lord. He worshipped him in beauty. If you notice, the very beauty began in the devil. He went to the north and set up a kingdom to Ashan Michael. The devil has always dealt in beauty. And today in some of these great fine 
big fine churches and some of these little old preachers standing down on the corner here in a little mission in a corner. They call them a bunch of nitwits and are holy rulers and don't know what the church of the living God standing down there and in those little missions and things. And we sat in great fine plush seats and pipe organs in all of our dignities and put on and not realize that the very beginning of that is a devil. That's right. That might make you a little bit sick, but it will do you good. If you don't make you sick, it don't do you any good. Mama used to, we was raised a little old poor farm poor. Mama would put meat on skins in a big old thing and put it back in the oven and boil it out or render as, as render it out to make the grease to go in the corn prune of a morning. I don't guess you New York people know how to eat cornbread and things like that. But every Saturday night, it was a big old bath and a big old cedar tub. Pour the hot water in there. Well, everyone, the same water, every one of us kiddies, and then took a big dose of castor oil. I took so much of that stuff till I can't even smell it today. I used to come to mama and say, oh, mama, it just gags me to smell it. She said, if you don't make you sick, it don't do you any good. So that's the way it is with preaching the gospel. If you don't stir up your religious gastronomics, it just don't help you. It don't help you very much. Let it squeeze you down a little bit, pinch this corner in that corner. Amen. All right. I'm not amening myself. But I believe it myself anyhow. That's right. Look, them both religious boys, but the power of God is known by a special revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, not by some works, some other thing or another, something another. It's God revealing himself to you, his person, Christ Jesus, in your heart. That's where it's at. Now, look as they come up. There was nothing more than Judas and Jesus later on. As Cain killed Abel at the altar, so did Judas kill Jesus at the altar. And notice Abel, when Cain came, he made it beautiful. Probably put the lilies, the fruits, and fixed them all up there. Oh, how beautiful he had the real ritual. I suppose he'd have a DDD, double LD, on his name if he lived in today. He knelt down and said, Jehovah, I have did all this for you because my honor and respect is to you receive it and jehovah turned his back on him and here come abel from a stockyard a banyard i don't guess they had any hemp in that day so he had had a grapevine wrapped around this little old lamb's neck pulled it up and ble it bleating trying to keep away from the cross but it threw the lamb up on the rock he didn't have a lance so he probably picked up a sharp rock pulled its little head back and began to chop its neck till its blood bleated bleat and dying did you ever hear a lamb dying why it's the most pathetic thing you ever heard is to hear a little lamb dying and abel with his head pulled back chopping on his little throat like that and the blood just spreading out all over the rock and over his hands his little white wool being bathed God looked down and said, that's it, hallelujah, that's it. What did it speak of? The Lamb of God led away with a hemp rope around his neck two, four thousand years later, there on the cross with mockery spit as bloodly locks dripping around his shoulders, bleeding, bleeding, speaking in another tongue. When he was dying yonder, could Abel understand his blood's voice? No, sir, he knowed his voice. But... He didn't know his language, and so he was speaking in tongues at the cross. When he was dying, he was God's lamb slain from the foundation of the world for lost sinners. Remember, Abel died on the same rock this lamb died on. And every man that comes to Jesus Christ, man or woman, boy or girl, has got to die on the same Calvary that Jesus died on, self-sacrifice, laying on that rock of ages, sacrificing themselves, their own ideas, their theories and everything, and giving fully over to the Holy Spirit. Certainly, notice, as them two spirits come up, I wish we had time to take them, like on the ark, we bring it through bad life, you can bring it through animal life. The grizzled bay and the red horse and so forth, look in the ark, here setting in the ark, here set a crow and a dove, both of them birds. One could fly where there are, other 
one could could do anything. But when they turned them loose, the crow was satisfied with eating the de dead old things, and he could digest them all right. But the dove is one bird who hasn't got a girl. He can't digest that kind of a stuff. So he came back to the ark. What was he? He was a crow to begin with. And he was a dove to begin with. And every man that's born of the Spirit of God hasn't got the girl to digest the world anymore. It isn't whether we hold on from one revival to the other one. It's whether where Christ held on to Calvary. It ain't what I am. It's what I am in Christ Jesus. As he died for me, not only my holiness, not your holiness. It's his holiness we stand in. Yes, sir. Notice. Here's another beautiful picture comes to my mind now of the children of Israel when they were brought up out of Egypt and they crossed over into the new land, over into the land that they were going on the road. Oh, come up. There never was a generation. They were called the people of God when they was pulled out. They were the church of God. The very word church means called out. God getting his church together calling out, not out of damnation, a people for his name, called out, come out from among them, called out, separated a church for his name. Listen closely. Now we are going along. Now we are going along as was Israel, called out a bunch of holy rollers. Exactly. What is it? Israel was this group here. What? them to trees as they come up out of Eden. Now, let's see where we're living on. Here come Cain with his spirit. Here come Abel from his spirit. They're moving up. Now, Israel comes out representing this over here. Now, watch them. When they come out, I said Holy Roller a few minutes ago. That didn't go good. They was Holy Rollers when they crossed the Red Sea and got the victory over the enemy. Moses sang in the spirit and Miriam picked up a tambourine and ran down the bank dancing beating and the tambourine the daughters of Israel followed her beating tambourines and dancing in the spirit if that ain't a holy roller meeting I never seen one in my life they were holy rollers so holy roller religion isn't something new you call it holy roller I never heard of a such a church in my life but they are branded that. That's the devil's name he puts on it. But they was holiness people, screaming, shouting, singing in the spirit. Did you ever see it in the meeting? How many ever seen something like that? Raise up your hand. Why, sure. Just the same. Spirit, it begin back in the Garden of Eden. It's coming on today. Now watch. Here that will shock you. When they come on up, there was another group. And when they had to pass through to the promised land, they had to go through by the way of Moab. And as they did, now Moab, they were religious people. Moab sprang out of Lot's daughter's children from their father daughter. And Moab was on this side. Here is Moab's spirit. Now watch. Here comes Israel and here is Moab. Israel sent and asked if he could go through. He said, no, sir. See, he's against his fellow. So then they had a prophet over there, a very religious man, and they went and got him to come down and curse his people. Now watch the nature of that and look today, the fundamentals versus full gospel fundamental. Yeah, I don't mean some of the real ritualistics out here. I mean the fundamental church. Cain was fundamental. Notice, they, here they come, Moab, a believer in Jehovah God, Israel, a believer in Jehovah God. Here is Israel camped up the bottom of the mountains, waiting to pass through the land. There is his brother Moab, says, you can't do it. So, they sent over and got an old Baxterian preacher and brought him down there. And on the road down, a mule spoke in tongues to him and told him not to do it. There you are. But he went on. Anyhow, is that right? And when he got down there to where the fellow was, now look, the preacher said, build me seven altars, God's perfect number, and on there make seven sacrifices of ox. Clean sacrifice. And Israel, they had seven altars, God's requirement. They had seven ox. Talk about fundamental. Both of them were fundamental. Then he said, put me seven rams on here. 
what do the Ram speak of? Any religious teacher know that Ram spoke of the coming of the Lord Jesus. So they had the sacrifice, seven Rams here, seven Rams here. Now, if you're going to look at both spirits, if Am would be God in the judgment, who is right? Now, here is a man offering seven rams, seven altars upon seven altars and seven clean sacrifices, seven altars, seven rams, seven bullocks, exactly both of them the same, just as fundamental, both of them was as they could be. All right, Baptist, get your heart set. Don't go out, all right. If God requires fundamentalism, why didn't he accept them? The same as them. If fundamentalism taught in the church is all God requires, he would be unjust to refuse the sacrifice and accept this one. He would be unjust. See, the spirit. Now, who was in the beginning? Cain. Watch the evil spirit living up. Now, they both had seven altars, both had seven rams, both had seven ox, one and the other, and both of them kneeling, praying to the same God. That's right. Both of them believed in the same God. A beautiful picture today of the fundamental church and the full gospel church. That's exactly. You see, what's the difference? Just a minute. Let the Holy Spirit reveal it. Here he is. They are offering the same sacrifice just as fundamental as these are over here. Now watch. This type up here, they were an organized group. They had their own nation. Israel was a bunch of interdenominationals. They didn't belong. They didn't have any country. They were wanderers, pilgrims, hallelujah. They didn't have, they wasn't organized. These people had a nation. They looked there and said, look at those scoundrels. Why? They are nothing to them. They are not even a nation. They are a bunch of hitchhikers. They're just passing through and getting what they can. And little did they know it, that was a church of the living God. I said, we are a great nation. And who are they? A bunch of backwash, a bunch of holy rulers said, we know who Jehovah is. Why? We believe in him. We got all the parchments here. We got everything here. We offer the sacrifice. We worship God. Said, we'll go down there and curse that bunch of holy rulers. Said, look what they've done. They've lived with their own mothers. They have done all kinds of illiterate things. You know that's true. But here is what they fail to see. They fail to see the brass up and the smitten rock, the pillar of fire. That's what they fail to see. So he come up here. Because why? Just as long as they was fundamental, that's all they cared about. And that's the way it is today. Don't never jump you Pentecostal preachers to a fundamental man. He believes in the birth, the virgin birth. He believes the death, the resurrection, the ascension. He believes in the second coming of Christ. He's just as fundamental as he can be. Don't try to argue with him on the scripture. He knows what he's talking about. I come out of the church. I know, yes, sir, just as fundamental as any full gospel could be. But he can't take the full gospel. He can't stomach it. He, that's right. He digests it not right. Amen. You got a lot of grace to set under all of that. But you're doing it, all right? Notice, may the Holy Spirit now settle down while you drive this down to the glory of God. Here was a man worshipping. Here was people worshipping. Here was... Uh, groups of the earth worshipping, tribes of the earth worshipping here. One of the, them down the valley as a bunch of holy rulers, the other one on a hill as a great dignified nation. Watch what Balak done. He called out all the dignitary, the men with their great long gowns on, all the princes, they stood around just exactly what God requires. The altars, the sacrifices, they lit the altars, the fire began to burn. All the dignitaries with their hands up, saying, Great Jehovah, thou knowest us, this great nation. Thou knowest that how we love you and how we, wor we worship you. And now look at this group coming through down here. We pray that we cast that group just as religious. Here is his brother Israel down here. Anogony, the bunch of tent dwellers down there, a bunch of just crime among them, and everything else down there, worshipping God over the same sacrifice. If fundamentalism is all it requires, this man was just as, just as Israel was. Do you get it? Here is what made the difference. Now, God, Balak had 
Dan been refused. God Dan told him, don't you cast that people because I bless them. So he goes down to do it anyhow. Bull's head, wanting money, wanting to have a parade, wanting a DD to his name or something. He wanted to, to be a big fellow, a big shot, as we call it. Excuse that expression. Because it used to be on the street. But you understand it plainer. Notice he goes down then and he thought he wanted to be a big something. He had, he goes down to make a name, a prestige. So he starts forward to meet God. God met him. Now watch what they did. Balak the king took him back there and showed him the utmost parts of Israel. The hinder parts of Israel. Is that true? The Bible readers, the utmost parts, the worst part. He didn't want him to see this part. He just showed him the utmost part. And I wonder a lot of times if people call us fanatics and out of our heads and things, if they are not just trying to point the worst parts. They say, I know a holy royal preacher that Running the mother man's wife, yes, and I know a lot of Baptists and Presbyterian done the same thing, but you are big enough to keep it hushed up. But God knows all that about it, that's right. Now they said, just look at the atmosphere part. And when he went back there, then, and he said, now go back, he was going back to cast them. And God said, you return and go back and you say just exactly what I put in your mouth. Amen. I like that. Oh my. I think of him. He went back there and he started to put the curse on the people. Instead of there, he blessed Israel and he said, I beheld you from the hilltops and I don't see any iniquity in you. Hallelujah. There you are. It's election. I've never seen you from a little place like this. God said, I've looked at him from the hilltop and I don't see any iniquity at all. Hallelujah. There you are, the true church. Yes, sir. What made the difference if they are both fundamental? Both Bible churches, both teaching the same doctrine, both the same. What made the difference? God vindicated Israel by signs and wonders. And that's the same thing today. He's doing today between the full gospel and the fundamentals. He's vindicating his church with signs and wonders. God has always, when the church of the living God is moving, there's healing, there's power, there's signs, there's wonders. Hallelujah. They had them. What they had before was a brass serpent. They had a Christ before them. They say, we got it too. But he vindicated. He didn't have indicated. it. He said, here it is. And today, the difference between the fundamentalism and the full gospelism, God is vindicating the full gospel by giving them signs and wonders and miracles. These deny it. Hallelujah. Oh, my. When I think of it, that I stepped off on that tree to get on here, I see the vision. I am glad today that I am a holy ruler. I'm glad today that I believe God has his signs and wonders and miracles and so forth. He's a vindication of the living God. Hallelujah. That was a difference. They had the same Bible as they read. They made the same sacrifice that they made. But God, looking down, that's exactly like he did on Cain and Abel, he refused them and put his signs over here. Glory. The full gospel preachers may be uneducated. They may be illiterate. But they got sense enough to know that God is, when he comes in the midst, they let him have his way. And signs and wonders accompany that ministry. Hallelujah. It's a truth. God always vindicates his church by signs and wonders. He's always been the son of God. A shout of the king is in the camp. The shout of it in the camp of a king. The king is... In the camp today as a bunch of people look here in the church today of a city like new york of seven million people and perhaps a thousand people sitting here in this afternoon meeting there shows where the heart is that shows where the treasure is they might bring some fellow in here with a ddd on his name like that set up out here because he come through some great Hartford College or some or Oxford out of England or something and tens of thousands of people would swarm in, ask him, does he believe in divine healing? Well, I should say not. Do you believe in signs and wonders? Oh, that's passed away with the ages gone by. Jesus Christ said, a little while in the world will see me no more, yet you'll see me, for I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. Here he is over here. Hallelujah. Well, they say they're uneducated, he said, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, say the Lord, not by seminary, 
not by degrees, not by, but by my spirit will I vindicate my church. Amen. You say, Brother Branham, it went right up, right on up. Look at their climb up. It came to the Pharisees just as religious as it could be. They had everything fundamental, just as fundamental as Jesus Christ who came off of this tree. But when Jesus was there, he couldn't call a crowd like the Pharisees could. They could call two million Jews at one time, any time. Jesus' little crowd ran from a thousand up to five thousand, something like that. Poor Galileans who had him. But what was the difference? Both of them was reading from Isaiah. Both of them was reading from Jeremiah. But God vindicated Jesus Christ by signs and wonders. Didn't Peter tell them on the day of Pentecost, said, You men of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God by you. How? By his theology, by his great scholarship, by signs and wonders and miracles which he did among you. Amen. Oh, brother, when you drop across the sea yonder into the other countries, they come say, I'm a missionary. They're sick and tired of such stuff. That's right. Come over here, there to teach them some new theology. They know the Bible before we ever was a nation. They say, we don't care for missionaries and some new theology. What we want is somebody to make the word of God alive and speak it. That's what the world needs today is a manifestation of the Holy Ghost, the resurrected Jesus Christ, putting his being into power in the church. That's what the world's wanting to see. Certainly it is, no matter how fundamental and how your theology and how you have trained it through the Bible, if God doesn't vindicate it, it's wrong. And you're wrong. The letter killeth, the spirit maketh alive. Amen. You won't like me after this, but remember, I may never see you again till we see you to judgment. I've been honest with you all along, and I'm honest with you now, but I've got to answer the day of judgment for these things. Look here, fundamental. Cain, Abel, Israel, Moab. Now look, Jesus come. Where's the tree he come off of, out of the land of Abel? There was that religious cult. The very same group crucified the Lord. They said they'd even kill you, thinking they was doing God's service. That's still in the future for us. That's right. There is that group, just as religious, just as fundamental, teaches the, the Bible. Where did it begin in Gen? Remember, God takes his man, but never his spirit. The devil takes his man, but never his spirit. The same spirit was upon Elijah, come upon Elisha, come out of John the Baptist, hundreds of years later, and prophesied to come again in the last day. See how fundamental, how would that but God vindicates with signs and wonders? Look at the great Saint Paul. To hurry up with it, the great Saint Paul, before dying, wrote to Timothy, he said, In the last days, this, this day, you believe this is the last days, perilous times will come, men will be lovers of their own selves. Now, let me tell you something I've got a degree, lovers. I belong to the biggest church. We belong, lovers of their own selves, proud boasters, blasphemers, heady, high minded lovers of pleasure among the lovers of God, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, and despises of those that are good. Or oh, you say, Brother Burnham, that shows communism. No, that ain't. It's, it ain't. That's fundamentals. Oh, what? Them people? Why they'd be devils? They'd be? No, no. They're religious. The Bible said they would have a form of godliness, but would deny the power they owe. Is that right? How many believe the Holy Ghost said that? That's exactly right. They'd have a form of godliness, just like Cain had with his worship, just like Moab had with his worship, just like Caiaphas had with his worship. And just as the fundamentals has today with their worship, having a form of godliness, but will deny the power they owe, which come from Abel all the way through. Amen. Don't feel sorry for us. Just come on, get on this side, see how it is. When I was a little boy, we used to run, jump in the water. Then, first one, hold, just hold up. If he could, uh, cold, if he would just hold up one finger, oh, it's cold. If he had two fingers, the water was warm. Come on, get in. I got two fingers up this afternoon, the water is fine. Come on get in. See how it is? It's troubled right now. The Holy Spirit moving on my fundamentalism versus full gospel. There's where God's church is. There's where God lives is where God is. Signs and wonders accommodate him. Where this is, it's got a form of goodness, but deny this. Now you 
go, you can go out of the big churches today. There's a man in the Baptist church, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, anywhere you want to, <coughs> you want to go, Catholic, whatever you want to, that actually believes this over here, but they can't unless they leave their church. So they hold on to the church instead of receiving the Lord Jesus. In the days when Jesus was here on earth, there was a look at little old Jairus. He believed Jesus, so he couldn't come to him because his church would put him out. But he got a need one time and had to come for healing. And there you are, many of them borderline preachers today, secret believers, there you are. But brother, here is the church of the living God. Your signs and wonders are accommodating and proving that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead by signs and wonders. That's that saith the Lord. Amen. Oh, how I advise you get off and get on, brother. There you are from Genesis. We are plumb up here in the seed now. Here not long ago, when Brother Baxter and I, that's um, here with us now, we was up in Canada. I was uh, thinking of this great, right here, I've been uh, out that day wandering around, and I've been chasing an old bear. And that old fellow, he got away from me. And I was, uh, well, 1,100 miles, I guess, or something, I'd say, at least 700 miles or more from a hard top road. Oh, we was way up in British Columbia, way up in the mountains, way back, two or three days back, but with pack horses. And I had been up there after some goats on the mountain and I'd run into an old bear and I started chasing him. I got uh, kind of lost from the rest of the brethren and I rode around there till a while and it got kind of towards dark and I thought, well, which way did I come in here? There's no roads, there's not, nothing. I thought, well, I guess I'll just um, have to build me up a fire. So, and I stopped and I waited a while. I thought, no, them northern lights will probably produce enough light that I won't fall through a crevice somewhere. I'll make my way back because I can see. I come from north coming south. I got to go back north. So, I was going along there and I come into an old forest. Looked like it was going to rain. Great big old white clouds going over and the moon was shining. And when I stopped there, and that was the spookiest looking place I ever seen in my life. And them great big old white tall trees, just as bleak and bare as it could be. And that moon shining down on them, it looked like a graveyard. And I stopped. Seemed like the Holy Ghost said, get off that horse. And I tied him up to the little limb there. And I got off and I thought, Lord, what you stop me in the graveyard for? I looked around there and them great big old trees standing there. There'd been an old burn over years ago, many, many years, 40, 50 years ago. The fire had swept through there by some unknown reason and it burned all the bark of the trees. And they were standing there with great pines, maybe three, four foot thick at the bottom. And then I, I noticed the wind got to blowing. And every time the wind would blow, they'd go, ooh. I thought, oh my, hum. I looked that moon shining, big, old, white, blistered trees. I thought, what? It looks like a graveyard. This is a spooky place. And the wind blowed again. It went, oh, I thought, oh, what? You bring me here for Lord. What are you wanting to show me? Then the Holy Spirit began to reveal this to me. Do you know one time there were big trees? Why can't they move now? I said, Lord, that's exactly what Joel said. What the palm worm left, the caterpillar eaten. What the palm caterpillar left, the canker worm eaten. I thought, that's right, Lord. That's exactly, that's the churches of today. They stand with great big towering spires, great big names on it, some great big church, but what the Methodist left, the Baptist eaten. What the Baptist left, the Presbyterian eaten. What the Presbyterian left, the Lutherans eaten. And the first thing you know, they got stripped down to there is nothing but a great big old tombstone standing there. That's exactly right. And I thought, well, what's that wind blowing this for? And I said, Lord, that's right. You send me the wind from heaven, that from rushing mighty wind, like fell on the day of Pentecost. And when it strikes them, all churches, the only thing it can go is, ooh, 
the days of miracles is past. Oh, there's no such thing as divine healing. Oh, stay away from them people. That's just the way it does. And I thought, sure, there were trees one time, but they are dead. When Luther had a revival, he had a revival. And when Wesley had a revival, he had a revival. And both of them had signs and wonders. But the time, the kank homes and the palm homes and the ethics and so forth of the church has eaten out all the life-giving source out of the church. They took away miracles. E method is here. That don't believe in divine healing. Why I got Wesley's book myself when he was here in America. He was riding a horse to pray for a woman, and the horse fell and broke his leg. He got off and took his anointing oil and anointed the horse with oil and rode it away. Hallelujah. That's when the church was moving. But what happened? The parasites got into the church. Another new generation had come along and said, There's not just this thing as divine healing. We better stop that nonsense. All this hear things of all this shouting and going on, we better uh, culture the church. Brother, the Holy Ghost is what leads the church. That's right, take that out of it and you take the life out of it. It'll quit growing. That's right. And when God sends the Holy Ghost down, like he did on the day of Pentecost, the a mighty rushing wind, the only thing the church does is mourn and groan and say there's not such a thing. Why can't you bend? Because you're dead. That's exactly why she ain't got no life in it. She just stand there and the wind blows right against you. And you say signs appearing in his papers. This man coming out on the street. He was a cripple last night. He's walking today. Last night, there's a blind woman on the platform. She's saying today. The church, one big fellow at the church, oh, that's mental telepathy. The days of miracles is past, and the Holy Ghost is sweeping right over them. I thought, oh God, is there hope? Joel said, I will restore, saith the Lord. I thought, well, why would you ever restore? And again, the winds blew hard, and I looked down here, and coming up from under all them big old dead trees, here comes a new undergrowth. Ah, uh, what they call backwash. A bunch of new trees was coming up, little bitty trees, and they were green. Oh, every time the wind hit them, they were, uh, were flexible. They were full of life. They could rejoice. I said, hallelujah. There it is, Lord. An old-fashioned Holy Ghost meeting is on the road. You've got some undergrowth coming up. I will restore, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. I will restore, saith the Lord. You wouldn't send that wind, I thought. What the little tree is blowing for? That's a wind which hit them. They just flew with the wind everywhere. The wind twisted them backward, forward, around, upside down. They didn't care. They just frolic with the wind. And that's the way a church that's born again when the Holy Ghost hits them. They just cuts all kinds of shines. Hallelujah. Why is it? God said, I will restore, saith the Lord. The day that the caterpillar has left, the things that they had eat down, I will restore. I said, well, they are green, O Lord, but they are green enough to know how to give into the wind. And I thought, what does the wind blow them for? It only loses them up to make another big root, so the root can grow down, loosens the ground, so that the little tree can dig down deeper and get a better hold. And every time the Holy Ghost blows through, sends a great revival of signs and wonders, it only establishes the human heart in Christ Jesus. There you are, friends, there you are. I'm not condemning other churches. I'm not condemning the people of other churches. I'm condemning that cold, ritualistic, formal things that drags the souls of people to hell, that very, and they don't know it. Having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. In the Methodist church, there's people who believe in divine healing and the power of God. In the Baptist church, the same way. In the Presbyterian church and all over the other churches, they believe the same thing. My brother, don't let that church take that life out of you. Here's a place that you belong over here in Jesus Christ, where you are alive and God is working signs and wonders and miracles among you. I will restore, saith the Lord, see those two trees where they come up from Eden. There they are. Here they are. They come right on up. Them two spirits come right on up, just as fundamental. Do you mean, see what I mean? They are fundamental. They believe God, they worship God, they go to church, they pay tithes, they sacrifice, they believe the whole Bible, but they deny the power of God to speak with tongues, to shout, to interpret, to have signs and wonders and healings. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. The Bible said from such an away. That's right. 
here is the church to be in. How do you get in it, Brother Branham? Go join the Pentecostal realms. No, sir. The Pentecostal realms has no more to do with it than that guy. They're just as organized and just as cold and ritual as they are. The Church of the Living God is made up out of every group of people that's born again of the Holy Ghost. That's a real true the living God, the Presbyterians, Methodists, Catholics, and everything else that's born of the Spirit of God, they are in that church by the Holy Ghost, the baptism, amen. Not the denomination tag has nothing to do with it. They are the children of God, by the election of God, by the power of God, by the resurrected Jesus Christ in them. They believe in the supernatural, no matter what the church says about it. I feel pretty religious, amen. Oh, how I love him, how I praise him, how I love to see him. You see, Brother Branham, you condemn other churches. No, I'm not. I'm not condemning those people. I'm condemning those organizations for teaching the people a form of godliness but denying the power. When them people believe this is a truth, God set an open door before you. You believe in God with all of your heart. Accept the Lord Jesus in your heart. You cannot believe when you are in a formal it's a uh, hard no life to believe with a fine churchman told me not long ago he said reverend Branham, i don't care what would happen he said i do not believe in any such i said certainly not it's just for believers it's not for unbelievers it's for believers he that believeth and is baptized and these shines shall not maybe for certain these shines shall follow them and believe that's jesus own words is that right oh he said brother Branham, just for the apostles shame on you i got a girl at home sitting back there in the church seven years old knows better than that jesus said go into all the world and preach this gospel to every preacher Two thousand of the world hasn't never heard it yet. These signs shall follow them in all the world that believe in my name, the cast out devils, that speak with new tongues, and so forth, heal the sick, form of holiness, denying the power thereof from such turn away. See where it started in Eden, see where it's winding up here. Fundamental Jesus said they'd be so close it would would deceive the very elect if possible. Deceive the very elect. Now don't go condemning saying, Well, I wouldn't be a Methodist, I wouldn't be a Baptist, brother. If you are Pentecost and having a form of holiness, cause you are Pentecostal, you are just as dead as they are. That's right, Pentecostal church don't save you. Jesus Christ saves you. That's right. Well, you say, Brother Branham, I can't just go with it. The worst part I ever was treated in all my life was by Pentecostal church. The biggest denial of the faith I ever met in my life was a Pentecostal preacher. When I was in the Southland, I had a great meeting, and the Lord was a blessing in the great arena, and had several hundred seats belonged to one of the biggest organizations of Pentecost. And I went over, my managers did, and asked him if they would rent them seats at 50 cents a piece a day. He said, I wouldn't let a man sit in my seats that believed in this divine healing. Pentecostal. So don't get your head stuck up because you're Pentecostal. You've got to be of Christ or you're lost. That's right. David in the old scripture, he said, it tastes like honey in the rock. Taste and see the Lord is good. David was a shepherd. On his side, he carried a little script bag. When his sheep got sick, he took honey out of the strip bag and put it on the rock and all the sick sheep went to licking on it and when they went to licking on this rock they are licking on the honey tasting the honey they got some of the limestone and the limestone healed the sick sheep now brother i got a whole script bag full of it here this afternoon and i'm going to put it on christ jesus not on a pentecostal church or no other church and you sick sheep go to licking i'll tell you if you go to licking on the honey you are sure to get some of the limestone and get back healed that's right just lick as long as you can lick and it will be on praise jesus not on the pentecostal presbyterian Lutheran, methodist it will be where it belongs on jesus christ the son of god yes sir here some time ago i got a lesson on it god restoring his people he said he'll restore all the former days He's doing it right now and the people don't realize it god is doing this thing and the people don't realize it now look can you see if you see what i mean out of eden those two spirits coming if you see that say amen you see this how 
is fundamental all the way through it goes out fundamental and this was fundamental plus the vindication of god's power which was signs and wonders you see that there is a church see what i mean it's believers now here sometime we're going to lead ohio in closing I had a meeting and i was eating at a little dunkard restaurant some of the largest people the woman was dressed in had long hair and long dresses like ladies or to dress like the pentecostal woman used to dress you let down the bar somewhere didn't you uh-huh the pentecostal church had become a disgrace that's right a long time ago it was wrong for women to cut off their hair and they wear all this stuff money from the lips and things but now it's all right well the devil might have went out of fashion but he didn't go to business he's still in business yes sir rest just like the rest of the world here some time ago a woman said to me say by the do you mean to tell me that you believe it's wrong for women to wear some money from my lips and i said there's one woman in the bible that did that a woman never did paint her face to meet god she painted her face to meet men mm-hmm. and that was Jezebel. Jezebel painted her face and put a round tie around her head and went out to meet the man. You know what God did to her? He fed her to the dogs. So when you see a Christian woman saying she's full of the Holy Ghost and nothing like that, just say, how do you do, Mrs. Dogmeat? That's what God calls her, Miss Dogmeat. He fed her to the dogs. That's exactly right. I didn't say that for a joke. I don't mean believe in joking. This is a pulpit. But I'm telling you, brother, it's a disgrace the way you women and they, what did it? Your pastors let down behind the pulpit to preach the truth. The greatest sponsor they got in America is Pentecostal people. But brother, it was like in the time of revolutionary in Paris in France. They needed a revolutionary in the time of John of Arc. They had a revolution. They had needed a counter-revolutionary. The full gospel needs to be preached. Then they need a revival. That's right. Clean them up a little bit. An old brother used to say, sing. We let on the bars. We let on the bars. We compromise the sin. We let on the bars. The ship got out. But how did the ghost get in? We let on the bars. That's it. What did it exactly? I was standing in a little place out here. I was eating a little, little dunk at restaurant. These clean looking ladies walking around just as clean and no stuff over their fingernails and eyes and so forth. They walked in. It's a pleasure to get to meet and feel that real warm Christian spirit. And we sat there and eat by the Baxter and I. Sunday, closed up, they went to church. We had to go across to an ordinary popular American place to eat a restaurant and I went in there and as soon as I walked in the door, there stood a policeman playing a slot machine. A man my age with his arm around a woman, the law of the nation, and it's legal to gamble in Ohio and there was a law itself breaking the law. Such a corruption. I'm not afraid of communism taking this country. I'm not afraid of Russia coming over here, taking it, or Germany here. It ain't going to be that. It's our own rottenness among us is going to is what's killing us. That's exactly right. I'm not afraid of the robin that pecks on the apple. He ain't going to hurt the apple. It's a worm at the core that kills the apple. Yeah, that's right. Brother, unless this America has a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival, she's gone. That's right. And an American. I'm American. I walk all over the graves of dead Burnham through Paris and through Germany and through there. And if I had to give my life for it, I'd do it. Yet, it's the greatest nation in the world. But it's a disgrace. The way you're letting down people, women come from India, different places, and they wouldn't even live here from, from the disgrace. The way the American women act, what is it? You have let down the bars. When our GIs went overseas, 2,000 of them was divorced the first six years. In the first six months, the overseas, more of the women out in these factories and things working is a disgrace. That's right. Oh, you don't love me now, but rather you'll know at the day of judgment, I've told you the truth. That's right. I went over to this place and there stood that police standing there playing a slot machine. I thought, what? The law in our nation? And I looked back and there was some boy sitting there and a young lady immorally dressed them with their hands on her, around her body, where it oughtn't to be. I thought, my, I looked over here, and there sat an old woman, about old enough to buy my grandmother, about 65 years old, with a little bitty tight clothes on her. People looking stuff on her mouth and fingernails and toenails, and her poor old skin was so wrinkled up. She had a big flower in her hair, a little gray hair, and uh, it's blue looking, and up like that, all shingle popped up. Now you think... I'm uh, joking. I'm not joking. I'm preaching the gospel. 
I want you to understand it. Surely God wouldn't give me the power of vision and so forth if I didn't know what I was talking about. I'm telling you, you was the truth. That's what you need here in New York, yeah? And when what happened, I looked at her and I thought, oh, goodness. And there she sat there with two old drunkards and them sitting there with a bottle of whiskey around them. And I thought, isn't that a disgrace? Some old mother, like that grand, old grandmother. And I thought, oh, God, how could you stand it? Why don't you wipe the whole thing off and forget about it? And I was condemning the woman with all of my heart. Now, just a minute, I stepped back behind the door to offer prayer. And when I did, I saw a vision. I saw a world, it was revolving in the air, in the air, and I saw a rainbow around her. I said, this is the blood, and that every sinner in the world would be condemned. And God would take your life this very minute if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus holding the wrath of God off of you. Then I noticed I draw a little closer and I seen someone standing there with perspiration of tears and blood mixing coming down. It was the Lord Jesus and I seen the mockery spit all over his face and I saw the blood of his brow and his precious hands bleeding. I see him dodging like that and I said, my Lord, what makes you dodge? He said, my blood has acted as a bumper to your sins all these years. I thought, has my sins did that Lord? I said, yes. I was laying there and there was an old book laying there of sin all over it and my name was written on it. And I said, God, just like a bumper to the car, keep so the car from getting hurt. The bumper, the blood of Jesus Christ, when I was a sinner, was keeping God's wrath off of me, acting like that as a bumper of the car. I said, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, Lord. I didn't mean to do that. Which bumping like that, he reached down, he took his hand to his side, wrote down with blood pardoned, just closed up the book, put it back behind him like that, and he looked me right straight in the face. He said, now I forgive you, but you're condemning her. I said, God, be merciful to me. I don't condemn her. I won't condemn her. Lord, no more. That is, it's a love the world's dying for. I'm not condemning your church, brother. I went over to her and I sat down. After the vision was over, the men had got up and I went up to the restroom or somewhere and I said, lady, she said, hello there. I said, honey, she started to put her arm around me. I said, just a minute, lady. I took her by the hand. I said, are you a mother? She said, oh yes. How did you know? I said, I wanted to ask you something. I said, I'm Reverend Branham. Do you ever hear? Oh, she said, the man that's down here in the arena. Yeah, I said, I'm glad to know you. And I said, was you ever a Christian? And I seen her eyes coloring in a few moments. She was crying. She said, yes, I was. Yes, I was. I raised up a Christian. She said, but I took the wrong road because I was ill-treated husband. Uh, ill-treated by husband. I said, I took a, ro a road and I got daughters in the world today. And she went ahead, began to talk. And I said, Lord Jesus still loves you. I took her baby. The vision, she said, do you mean that you will take me now? I said, just the way you are, he wants you now. And there, by the side of that booth, amongst all those people, we broke up the slot machine gun and turned it into a prayer meeting. And the woman got gloriously saved there. What if I had been walking away condemning her? Brother, it's not a condemnation that's bringing them into the fold of the living God. And my, if there's a person here today that's out of God's kingdom, may you come while we pray. Heavenly Father, you said, I'll restore, say the Lord, that poor, wretched, miserable woman sitting there, heaped in sin, drawed down till the dogs would hardly look at her. And yet, now today, she's one of your children, gloriously saved, because someone spoke to her just a few words of kindness and directed her thoughts back to the right path. God grant today that if there are sinners here that they will come today and be saved if there's any backsliders and has been going to somewhere that's kind of cold and formal and they realize that they've been out of the will of God, grant that they will come to this afternoon and restore, be restored back to the great powers of the Holy Spirit again. Grant it, Lord Jesus, we pray the blessings for thy glory. Well, we have everybody heads bowed and everyone in prayer. I wonder if someone will slip up their hand, say, Brother Branham, I want you to be restored this afternoon. Would you just raise your hand? Someone in the audience, God bless you. And you and you and you, that's right, up in the balcony, say, 
I want to be restored. God bless you, son. God bless you, buddy. God bless you, sister. God bless you over to my left. Somebody over here say, I want to be restored by the Branham. I want a living faith and a living love and a living God in my heart. I've fooled long enough, just kind of taking theologies. I want a real experience with God. Would you raise up your hand? Say, pray for me, if you will. If God will open the eyes of the blind here and pray my prayers. If he'll make the people as well raise up and walk, if he'll make a deaf to hear and the dumb to talk, surely he will answer my prayer for your soul. Then, brother, no matter how you might be setting, how it up in the cancer, you're not in the half of condition that you are uh, setting the for experience because your soul means more than your body. Don't you accept him this afternoon? Come to all I want to be remembered in prayer at this time. Would you stand up on your feet? Say, Brother Branham, even before my neighbors, before this church, I stand today and ask, I want to be restored back into love in my heart again. Like it once had, would you stand to your feet somewhere in the building? God bless you, God bless you, Brother. God bless you, you and you, you stand up everywhere here. That the baptism of the Holy Ghost has been restored to the full measure of God. Would you stand up? Someone without the Holy Spirit that needs the Holy Spirit and wants to be restored to God will stand to your feet at this time. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Now, do you see what I mean, Mr. Brothers? This handful of less than a thousand people. Look in the people. That's you mean standing on the prayer can every father. There's one thing that I cannot do. That's to restore these people. I can only bring them to you. I can only bring them to the foot of the cross now. I can only bring them to the face of Lord Jesus God. While they're standing here with heads bowed, hearts longing to be right. How do we know? They are not to be here tomorrow. This city may be laid to the solid waste by morning. An earthquake could assault it, an atomic bomb could strike it. Anything would happen. They may not be a living person on the face of the earth by morning. We don't know. One thing we do know that we've got to stand before God. Father, this poor message chopped up in the way, only way I have bringing it. I pray that it sink, sank deep into the hearts of the people and they'll step away further from the old former ritual ideas and come and be born again of the Holy Spirit. May they each one receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Grant it, Lord, as they're standing here. Restore them, place their back over their burnt bodies and give life anew to them. And may they frolic as the winds of God sweep down and as they hear the winds going up like David did through the marble bush. May they be flexible to the Spirit granted, Father, through thy Son, the Lord Jesus. While remain standing, I'm going to ask about the bug. We'll continue praying here. Just a minute, Brother Bug.